Coming up, what on earth happened? And what now? And why so much drama? The winners and the losers of our big primary election. Plus, the mayor getting hot under the collar amid a new wave of violence. 24 shootings, six deaths, all in five days. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Fasten your seatbelts and put your tray table in the upright position. We're in for a bumpy ride. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. What a tumultuous week of news, and it seems to be changing by the moment, but here to make sense of it all, KCTV5 news reporter Caroline Sweeney, who has been working overtime to cover the twists and turns of the Kansas governor's race and also keeping track of Kansas side politics from the Shawnee Mission Post, reporter and editor Jay Center, from 41 Action News, anchor and reporter Dear Wall, and the star political analyst, columnist and editorial writer Dave Helling. Primary election day in our bi-state brings with it huge amounts of drama, suspense, anger, name-calling. We begin on the Kansas side, where Topeka State Senator Laura Kelly wins the Democratic nomination for Kansas governor. That we know. What we still don't know is who she'll face. As you all know, the uh, race is too close to call right now. We all know that Kansans have made their voices heard, and they've made them heard loud and clear. We just got to go and tabulate those final votes, and it's going to take a little while. Now, as we end this week, it is still too close to count. About 100 votes separating sitting Republican Governor Jeff Collier from Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, who currently holds the lead. And we're told it could take up to two weeks before we know the final outcome. Two weeks, really, Caroline? Yeah, we could be looking at an August 20th deadline before we have any idea who the Republican nominee might be. You know, within the last 24 hours, especially yesterday, with the realization that there were some tabulation errors and inconsistencies on the part of the Secretary of State's office and some county offices, this could drag out for a long time because that word that we all kind of dread is being thrown around, recount is coming. Jay, what kind of votes are we still waiting on at this point? Well, absentee ballots, uh, mail-in ballots, and then provisional ballots, ballots that people cast at the polls, but uh, there's some question about whether they're, they're actually a registered voter or not. And there are 1,850 of those in Johnson County alone. Uh, so on Monday, we'll get a kind of a clearer sense of where things stand because the canvassing boards meet, but uh, boy, it's going to be a drawn-out fight. Some people concerned that is, as the Kansas Secretary of State, the chief election officer, Chris Kobach, oversees this, but he has now recused himself from any part of the counting involved in this, though he says that wasn't an issue anyway. It is local counties that handle the counting of these votes to begin with, Dave. Right, and I can't believe these words are going to escape my lips, but Chris Kobach is right <laughs> in this situation. The votes he may are use this for a future level, ad. Right. Okay. But having said that, there was a political cost, a huge political cost in the secretary's refu uh, refusal to recuse himself from the recount because people were saying it looks bad. It's just a horrible thing for the secretary of state to not only be involved potentially in overseeing the recount, whatever recount might come, but setting the a monetary amount that Jeff Collier would have to pay to satisfy the cost of that recount if it goes that far. Now remember, once the ballots are all counted, it's possible Jeff Collier could be in the lead. In that case, Chris Kolbach would have to file the challenge again to himself. So. It just as a political matter, it was good for him to step away. And frankly, we're writing this for the weekend. The state legislature should make that automatic in the in the years. But ahead. we're all getting a lesson here in how elections actually work, Dia. I mean, <laughs> let's face it, we're less than three months out from the general. So although some of these political candidates got real nasty as soon as the <laughs> results started coming in, two people who didn't, Kobach and Collier. They're really pushing the unity message. Look, we have to move forward as a party and we have to start campaigning. I don't know that they're as much in threat as they believe as a party um, for the governorship, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I do think it's important to point out, though, that uh, although the county level uh, uh, officials are the ones who oversee that recount, Chris Kobach, as the Secretary of State, has the authority to appoint the election commissioner in the four most populous counties. So in Johnson County, Sedgwick mm -hmm. County, Chris Kobach's the guy who gave those guys their jobs. Yeah, and I, I, let me just say quickly, our editorial will also say that has to stop because it turns election commissioners into patronage jobs. And we saw the results of that, which we may talk about. Does that about not happen in Missouri? 
Uh, no, there is a different system, and there are problems. There are problems with every election, Nick. It, it's only when they're very close that we see all these discrepancies and ballots that aren't counted. For example, Jay talked about the 1,800 provisional ballots in Johnson County. Half of those or more may not be valid ballots. We don't even know that. So there are inherent problems in the way we elect people in this country, different machines, different technologies, different people, different systems. It's a mess. We just don't know that until the race is very, very close, as was the case here. And all of those things will now be exposed. Now, also, in another interesting development in the governor's race this week, Kansas Democrats pledged to file a challenge to disqualify independent candidate Greg Ullman from appearing on the November ballot. On what grounds, Caroline? Well, I think the big concern here for the Democrats is the the fact that he gave Pat Roberts a run for his money several years ago, but he came in with twice as many signatures as he needed. So, you know, you're looking at a guy who really wants to run and is trying to walk that line the best that he can. So the Democrats really are worried that uh, he will take votes from them in oh, the absolutely. November election. So they have absolutely. to try every effort they can to yeah. keep him from uh, I the think, ballot. I yeah. think one of the things they're arguing is that the petition signatures, Nick, may have been improperly obtained. Now, he only needs 5,000, turned in 10,000. There will be a review of that. So it's not likely that the Democrats' challenge will prevail. But they're doing everything they can to try and separate Orman from the field. Now, before we start looking at some other interesting races decided this week on both sides of state line, one of the biggest stories was long lines and extraordinary long waiting times in Johnson County. No, these aren't the images of people waiting to get a driver's license. This time, it was people trying to vote. And then it took until 8 o'clock the next morning to even get the results from Johnson County? It's embarrassing for our office. It's embarrassing for me, for our team, for the vendor. Uh, they have taken ownership of this and uh, have committed that they will be discovering what is wrong and fix it. Alrighty, that's Johnson County Election Commissioner Ronnie Metzger. Did we ever, though, get a definitive reason as to what went wrong, Jay? No. Um, the Board of County Commissioners met yesterday. Um, there was very little appetite for anybody behind the dais or Election Commissioner Metzger in taking any responsibility for what went wrong. They pushed it entirely on the vendor ES&S out of Omaha, Nebraska. All they said was there was a software problem. But here's the key thing. The election office authorized the use of a combination of hardware and software that had not been fielded anywhere else in the country. After the I mean, debacle in November 2016, um, the election office said, let's go ahead and try something that's not been tried anywhere else. Um, and it, it totally failed. It was terrible. Well, we know what we know essentially what went wrong that night. It was they the smallest piece of technology failed when it should have taken seconds. It took hours. And when you have three thousand or excuse me, um, thousands of precincts across the state and hundreds of precincts in Johnson County alone, plus every single voting machine, those hours are going to start adding up. Now, I did notice also the editorial board of the Kansas City Star saying that Ronnie Metzger could resign, yet Johnson County Commission is pushing back, condemning the Kansas City Star, saying it was nothing to do with his credibility right. or his competence. This was really the vendor. They're the ones who are responsible, and those are the ones yeah. taking into account this. Well, so we're clear. We stand by our story and our editorial, because the buck has to stop somewhere, and it has to stop with the person responsible for the election despite what ES&S Systems, which is the company that does the machines, says or doesn't say. One of the things they said in their release was, oh, no votes were corrupted, no votes were lost, paraphrasing. Well, how do we know that? I mean, how do we, are we just supposed to rely on your word that votes weren't lost in an election which is 90, 100 votes apart? Somehow they weren't corrupted? No. Ronnie Metzger is the head of the operation. He's had two failed elections now. Uniquely, uh, unique failures, Nick. The, the, no other county in Kansas is waiting until right. eight in the morning to r report totals. Uh, we think he should step up, take responsibility, and go. Dia, did we see problems also on the Missouri side? I did note a couple of stories yeah. in, in Missouri about certain problems, including a man who was wearing a uh, Make America Great Again hat who you know, had to go home, he couldn't vote. And we also heard of somebody going to a polling station uh, in which some of the choices had already been filled in on their paper ballot. I mean, in addition to those, in Springfield, I was told they ran out of paper ballots at some of the voting precincts there on the Republican side. Also, power was lost in Blue Springs. So anytime you have an election that's this close, in all of these races, you're going to, like Dave said, 
find out about all of these problems. But the greater issue is vote integrity, right? Making sure that people can vote in a way that's convenient and timely so that people aren't getting discouraged and leaving the polls. Because if you need any other encouragement to know that every vote counts, the race for the Republican nomination for Kansas governor is 90, 100 votes apart. So I think that the problems definitely need to be corrected. We'll discuss some other remarkable results in Kansas in just a second. But yes, Missouri voted too this week. At the top of the ballot, Republican Josh Hawley, Democrat Claire McCaskill, both winning their respective party primaries for the United States Senate. Dear, you were at the Hawley watch party in Jefferson City election night. Was there anything unpredictable, remarkable, stunning, shocking about any of this? Party was in Springfield, no. Okay. Nothing exciting, nothing remarkable. <laughs> Everything that you would expect, right? Um, I did talk to quite a few supporters there, and the overarching theme was, he's not the most exciting. Sure, I wish he was campaigning more. Sure, I wish he was doing more, but he has the best shot to beat McCaskill. Stunningly, though, I, you know, there was no break from, from any of the campaigning. Literally, the next day, I saw attack ads from both of them on TV. So they never took any break whatsoever? I don't think there was a need to take a break. Claire McCaskill has been doing this a long time. Okay. So has Josh Hawley. Right. They knew exactly what was going to happen next. The biggest issue on the ballot was Proposition A in Missouri, a measure that would enshrine right to work in the, to the Missouri Constitution. 67% of voters rejecting that. In fact, it only passed in a small smattering of counties. Some people seem confused, though, by that, given that Missouri was a state that went big for Donald Trump, that is viewed as increasingly conservative. Why did so many voters vote no? Unions are huge in Kansas City. The Teamsters are huge. And voters didn't ask for this. So this came from... You remember the name, Eric Greitens, former governor. This came from him. This was one of his big pushes. And so this wasn't something that voters asked for, were pressuring for. It's failed before, so I don't know why anybody's surprised. Plus, the campaign was effective. I mean, they were all over the place with vote no signs. We talked about this last week. There's only a small percentage of people that this really applies to. But I think if you want to look at this nationally, this is kind of a slap in the face to one of the most recent Supreme Court rulings. This is Missouri saying, like, we want to make sure that we are protecting the people in this state. Is this the end of the issue, though? I did hear that Governor Mike Parson was interested in passing another law in, in Jefferson City uh, to bring back right to work. Right, Nick, and there is some whispering about that, although there have also been public statements in recent days after the vote from Republicans saying, no, maybe we shouldn't bring this up again, at least in the uh, near-term future, largely because the margin was so uh, a large. Dia is right that it's not surprising that it failed, but it is surprising that it failed by more than two to one in a state which is roughly nine percent union. That suggests a lot of non-union people, including, by the way, about 300,000 Republicans voted against right to work. I think that sends a real strong message to lawmakers and maybe to the governor that we ought to let this rest a little bit. Having said that, there is some chatter about trying to put it in the Constitution, which would require another vote. So I don't think it's disappearing entirely, but I think it's going to go on the back burner. Closer to home, voters in Kansas City approving a new rental inspection program designed to clamp down on unhealthy and unsafe rental properties. That passing by 56% of the vote. Are we to read anything into that result, dear? No, people want to live in safe, clean spots, you know? I think that's pretty simple. <laughs> and to be fully transparent... And it didn't cost them anything, it cost landlords. There we go. That's all that matters. Well, we'll look at some more intriguing results on the Missouri side in just a moment. But first, let's go back to Kansas, where a former MMA fighter who proudly identifies herself as Native American and gay wins one of the most anticipated elections in the metro. It seems unlikely. Raised by a single mom, from community college to the Ivy League. From a waitress to the White House. I've been put down, pushed aside, knocked out. Truth is, I've had to fight my whole life because of who I am, who I love, and where I started. Sharice Davids winning the crowded Democratic primary for the Kansas 3rd Congressional District seat, currently held by Kevin Yoder. Just before Election Day, her opponent Brent Welder getting all the attention, including a primetime spot on CNN. What happened in this race that propelled Sharice Davids to victory, do you think, Jay? Well, I mean, Brent Welder had very 
tenuous ties to the Kansas City area. I mean, he literally just moved here from St. Louis about a year and a half ago. Um, he received a lot of the national push. He was push. He was very uh, associated with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. Um, there's not a lot of grassroots support for that particular uh, faction of the party here in Johnson County. Uh, Sharif was able to line up support from city level um, people who already had constituencies. Um, I, I think Democrats sort of realized that Brent Welder was going to be uh, probably Kevin Yoder's easiest out, and Sharice Davids is probably going to be his hardest out. Do you think it is? You know, I will say I've always been of the opinion that Kevin Yoder had nothing to worry about this election season until this election. This is a woman with a remarkable backstory, and I can imagine her on Ellen and all of these national shows getting huge amounts of national free attention, plus lots of money coming into this district. To Jay's point, um, we spent a lot of time talking about how much Donald Trump won by. Donald Trump is an entity all in and of himself, right? And also national support and interest. People in Kansas City don't care about that. They want you here. They want you in their neighborhoods, knocking on doors. I think what Democrats have figured out very quickly, you look at Ocasio-Cortez in New York, the ground game is where you're going to win over most people on the Democratic side of the ticket. And let's face it, Sharice David's story resonates with a lot of people in this area, raised by a single mom, pulled herself up by her bootstraps, shall we say, and has really made something of herself. And I think that resonates Kevin Yoder, though, saying that she wasn't even actually from the district. Uh, she grew up in Leavenworth, had been living in Lawrence. She only came here to run. Is there any truth to that, and does that impact the way voters will feel about her? Well, she came back to Kansas City. She worked her way through the Johnson County Community College, went to Cornell Law School. The Kansas City Star has pointed out in one of their editorials several ways that she is connected to the area. Okay, so she's from Leavenworth, but you were. she was also up against a guy who moved here, you know, only a year and a half ago. So I think trying to say she's not from here is just parsing words. What about what does she actually stand for? We see an amazing backstory, the MMA fighter, yes, waitress to the White House fellow, all of that. But what does she actually stand for, Dave? Well, she's very much a mainstream Democrat, a bit to the left. Uh, surprisingly, though, Nick, she is certainly to the right of Brent Welder. And in fact, when we, we interviewed all six candidates at the editorial board uh, for before our endorsement of Sharice Davids, and uh, we were, before those interviews, convinced that she was sort of on the left with Brent. But when you talk with her, you understand that she wants uh, universal health care coverage, but suggests it's going to take some time. Uh, you know, there, she's against the tax cuts. I mean, it's a very mainstream Democratic uh, positions for, for her campaign. I will tell you, though, that there is strong evidence that Kevin Yoder is very worried. Yeah. Typically, he waits until three or four weeks out before the general, before he unloads the heavy guns. The day after the election, he was putting out pictures of Sharice Davids with Nancy Pelosi and calling her radical. That is, you know, it's very rare for Kevin Yoder to go to DEFCON 1 the day after the primary. That suggests he's very worried because her personal story, coupled with a potential Democratic wave, puts his seat in place. Okay, we can't go through every single election result, but there are some other interesting ones we just want to focus on in a quick round robin. While they may not be the headline grabbers, two moderate Republican state lawmakers in Kansas losing their seats, Joy Coaston and Patty Markley ousted by conservative challengers in Johnson County. Jay Center, you report that conservatives statewide could pick up as many as six seats as a result of this election? Yeah, um, Johnson County moderates were pretty much despondent on election night. Um, they saw all of the gains they made in the last election cycle wiped away, and they're going to be looking at numbers a lot closer to 2014 when Sam Brownback's administration had a very conservative legislature that it was allowed, able to move some stuff forward. Um, I think y you are probably going to see um, moderates in Johnson County also facing challenges from Democrats in the general election. So moderate Republicans are an endangered species. Now, some other interesting races. Jackson County Executive Frank White not only winning re-election, he wins with nearly 70 percent support. In fact, every single Jackson County legislator on the ballot getting reelected. When all you seem to hear about is problems with Jackson County government from running the jail to how money is spent to how they were even handling the sheriff's election, why such a remarkable vote of confidence in county leadership, Dave? Uh, well, I'm not sure it's a complete vote of confidence. Like a lot of races, particularly in a primary, Nick, uh, the Jackson County uh, campaigns were under the radar. And that's particularly true now with a diminished local newspaper. I mean, we just can't cover the county races the way we might have 
10 years ago, certainly not state legislative races. And when that happens, then people who sort of recognize names or have some comfortability with the candidates tend to vote yes. And I think that's what happened in Jackson County, despite the very well-documented problems uh, at the courthouse. All righty, a quick round robin here, starting with you, dear Wall. Complete the sentence. The biggest winner on primary election day in our metro was blank. Sharice Davids. Jay. Uh, people who wanted to see Kevin Yoder face a challenge. Dave. Yeah, I would agree with Sharice Davids. A bit of a surprise. It was amazing to me. A week before the election, no one who knew who she was. The yeah. day after the primary, she was on MSNBC, yeah, and yeah. she was suddenly the savior of the Democratic Party. That's how politics works. Caroline. <laughs> um, I'm going to say Laura Kelly because she's getting a jump on that uh, gubernatorial race. a good answer, race. too. Okay, well, what about then this sentence? Fin finish this for me. The biggest loser on primary election day was blank. Ronnie Metzger. <laughs> the Johnson County election. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. oh, oh. And he wasn't even on the ballot. No. He's the biggest loser. <laughs> Dia Wall. I think I have to agree. Even though he has been doing this for a long time, has a great reputation. Yeah. This Caroline Johnson Sweeney. County stuff is a mess. Yeah, I third. The, the wow. Johnson Alrighty. County voters. Uh, yeah. I would say Josh Svati, who was a Democratic candidate for governor. Yes. He finished third in that primary. Uh, Caroline is right. Uh, Laura Kelly was a big winner because she won by such a big margin. Svati finished third behind Carl Brewer. Uh, he was seen as a rising star in the Democratic Party in Kansas. He may still be that, but he has some recovery to do. Okay, well, believe it or not, there were some other stories making news this week. In spite of all the interesting election races, which local figure gets more national face time than anybody else this week? So let's talk about your decision to run for mayor. I'm seeing a lady in a few days who has a possum problem. I mean, like, I government thought politicians is about trying to solve people's had the problems. most boring lives. That sounds kick-ass. Come with me. That award goes to Jason Kander, appearing there on Late Night with Seth Meyers, the former Missouri Secretary of State and Senate candidate who's now running for mayor of Kansas City, also making appearances on Megyn Kelly Today and Morning Joe. Yet for all the positive attention, Kanda is put on the defensive locally as 41 Action News reveals, while he's now asking for your vote for mayor, he didn't actually head to the polls himself in recent elections. Just recently, he skipped the airport vote and the Go Bond infrastructure election. So uh, I was actually out of town for work and I forgot to vote absentee before I left. Uh, and like, I I'm not making any excuse for it because it's just a matter of life happening. Okay, is the voting history of a candidate important to you? Does it tell us anything about how they'll perform in office, dear Wall? First, shout out to Kat Reed for that fabulous Absolutely. reporting. And two, yes, it does matter. If you're asking me to make time and make a way when I'm working and raising a kid and doing all the things we do for our families, then yeah, I think it matters. He wasn't the only one who didn't vote. Some of the other candidates did not vote as well, but he's the most high profile. Caroline, does it make a difference in the public's mind, do you think? I think it makes a difference in the public's mind, but I mean, we're all human. We've all missed some elections here or there. And even though they are running and they should be voting, I think we have to look at the bigger picture as a whole. He can't be the only candidate who hasn't voted and still could be good in office, right? No, Jane? and I mean, it's just sort of like the lowest rung of like, what can I sling at somebody? I mean, you always see attack ads that he didn't vote in the 2016 primary. Like, you know, it's yeah, not no, I would. Yeah. I agree with that. On the other hand, and, and in fact, you're already seeing that about Sharice Davids. Yeah. I think Yoder is claiming she didn't vote or whatever. And so generally that's right. I think in this case, though, it may feed into the narrative about Jason Kander that he really doesn't care about yeah. Kansas City uh, because these votes were about Kansas City issues, the airport and the go bonds. And for the former Secretary of State to say, gee, I was too busy to fill out an absentee <laughs> ballot, probably not the best response. So I think at some point, it will be, first of all, it was great reporting, as Dia suggests, and then it will be an issue uh, come the mayoral election sometime in 2019. In other news this week, the mayor getting hot under the collar amid a new wave of violence in the city. While we don't track individual crimes on this program, isn't it important news when 24 people are shot, six are murdered, all in the space of five days? There is a connection. We just choose to act like it doesn't matter. We need our lawmakers in Jefferson City to understand that we need some real sustainable solutions to the slow motion mass murder that's taking place in Kansas City and in St. Louis. Okay, lots of angry words and indignation, but are our local elected leaders and police pursuing any different strategies here in tackling violent crime, dear? They say they've exhausted a lot of them. They've tried hotspot policing. They've tried to increase crime watch in neighborhoods. They've adjusted patrols. They've called people up. And they say those things aren't working. Uh, Mayor James has been a big advocate for more gun legislation, has been for the last seven years. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, but I thought the most fascinating thing was to see Chief Smith right next to him. 
Well, Dean and I were at that press conference with Mayor Sly James. I don't know if he's advocating for more gun legislation, but definitely different gun legislation than we have now. But I thought the message that stood out to me the most was this rhetoric of the community kind of watching out for the community. He kept saying things like, we're, we're, we've are we exhausted all of our options. Now it's up to you to try and like raise kids that understand conflict resolution doesn't end with violence. I am. I haven't had the chance, but I'm waiting to go out and talk to people in Kansas City to get their reaction to a local leader saying, hey, it's time for you guys to start figuring things out inside your own house. We heard Lou in Mission, one of our KCPT viewers, write to us. He says, in Kansas, you can carry a gun without training or a permit, yet you don't see that level of violent crime there. Lou says, is it time to focus on something other than guns, Dave? Well, we had a, a Facebook Live interview with the head of the Kansas City Board of Police Commissioners yesterday. Yesterday, Nathan Garrett, uh, who talked about this issue, obviously, and what the mayor had to say in the chief. And the idea is that no one solution is applicable in this case. There is no one tool in the toolbox that the police department or the community lacks uh, to bring the murder rate down. And so you've got to do all of it. You, you know, guns, gun control alone won't do it. Family focus won't do it. Mental health won't do it. Increased money for the police department won't do it. You got to do all of it, and you've got to do it as often and as aggressively as you can. And until Kansas City, I think, gets to that point, Nick, it's going to struggle with this every time violence breaks out, as it does routinely in our. Well, when you look at the mayoral race, though, upcoming, do you see that as the number one issue the candidates are talking about? I don't actually hear that. I don't hear them talking about it, but I think they should be talking about it. Absolutely. And, and I we're think so they far will. Out. I think they okay. will. Yeah, I think we're so far out. Okay. And that. Captain right now has turned off the fasten seatbelt sign. You are now <laughs> free to move around the cabin. That is our week in review. Our thanks to Caroline Sweeney from KCTV 5 News and Jay Center of the Shawnee Mission Post. From 41 Action News, Dear Wall, and from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Howling. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.